Hello and welcome to another episode of the Power Within podcast. I am your host, Lori. Today I feel incredibly humbled and blessed and honored to share with you my podcast episode with Mr. Graham Wardle. Many of you will know who Graham is from spending 14 years as the beloved character of Ty Borden on Heartland. But since Graham has left that show, he has expanded and grown so much. He has started up his own brand and and, and gotten into entrepreneurship, activism, editing, producing, uh, expanding out his whole writing. It's been a an absolute blessing and pleasure to follow his journey and to watch him grow and be so happy in life. I. I get so excited for Graham, like I feel this abundance of happiness in my heart when when you can see how happy he is. It's a great feeling. His work has meant everything to me in my own life. It saved my life. And so for me to have Graham on the show, it's really hard for me to put into words how much it means that he would come on to the show and and have this conversation with me to share with all of you guys. So I really hope you enjoy it. One of my favorite parts of the episode is when Graham discusses the power of your word and not just in the the respect of what's happening in the world. He encapsulates that in every part of his life and it was a really genuine conversation and you can see how truly wonderful he really is he's he's very genuine he's he's a man of integrity and class and the way he presents himself is just it's it's amazing and I hope that you guys love the conversation here I hope that you enjoy it I hope that you get a lot out of it and and really listen to what Graham has to share because there's a lot of information in here and I think that there's a lot of great information you guys can take into your own lives and apply it into your everyday situations. So without further ado, I will go ahead and share our wonderful conversation. Hello, Graham. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I feel very blessed and honored to have you on. How are you doing? I'm good, Lori. I'm excited to be here. This is awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So I want to start with, I know you've gone at length and talked about how you left Heartland and all of that stuff and how thankful and appreciative you were of that time. So I want to switch gears a little bit. So since then, you've stepped into some, to some new adventures um, with expanding your writing, producer, editor, podcaster, activist, and entrepreneur. How has investing in yourself and pursuing these new passions enriched your life, made you happier, and helped you live more authentically? Uh, how has it done that? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think by investing in yourself and taking a chance on yourself, it's like an automatic, it's like a mathematical equation. Once you do that, it automatically transforms the quality of your life because on a subtle or a spiritual level, you're, you're telling yourself, uh, I'm going to take a chance on myself. I'm going to take a chance on the things I love. I'm going to take a chance on the things I believe in. I'm going to stand in the values that I have. And by taking those chances and investing in yourself, you, you birth life into it. And then there, therefore it changes your life in the sense because um, you feel more connected to the sacredness of your own life and the, the preciousness of this uh, experience that we have here on earth. So doing these, these different avenues of expression, producing, writing, um, entrepreneurship, all these different uh, areas of my life that I'm now exploring and investing in, it's expanding uh, the quality of my life and my appreciation for life. So I think the, yeah, the crux of it is, you know, the more you invest in yourself and take a chance and believe in yourself and, and uphold the values that you hold dear and near to your heart, uh, the, the directly correlated is the quality of your life improves. Good answer. Good answer. I, um, this actually kind of, you kind of touched when you started talking about investing in yourself. Um, and I want to touch on that because in your newest or in your newest newsletter that you did on authentic giving, there was a part that really resonated with me. And it, you said, I urgently wanted to feel worthy of being loved that I would give endlessly to others in hopes they would give to me what I could only give to myself. 
This unconscious desire for acceptance and love infused itself into my generosity, making it unsustainable over the long term and led to an eventual burnout. So I find for me personally, I found that um, investing in yourself is a big part of self-love and getting in tune with yourself because a lot of times people tend to invest in other people so that they can hide those those parts of themselves. When you really start to invest in yourself, you have to really dig in and, and find those like self-love parts. Um, for you, what is that part of, of your journey as well into digging into those parts? Uh, can you phrase the question again? Can you say it again? So the the investing in yourself yeah. is that something that you know you were able to just go oh okay i'm gonna invest in myself or is that something that you had to say okay well i'm i need to love all of myself before i'm gonna invest in myself versus you know giving to other people or things like that so it's like a chicken and the egg kind of thing like which came first is that, is that what you're saying <laughs> I, I guess so <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> uh it's a great question i just i just want to do it justice because uh, i want to understand it um do I have to love every part of myself first before I invest? Uh, I would say no. I think it's a process of, of getting to know yourself and investing and loving yourself and then investing more. So it's kind of like uh, left foot, right foot. They're, I think they're intertwined. Um, but I don't think it's you have to have all of one before you can do the other or vice versa. Um, I don't think you have to completely and utterly love every part of yourself and be you know totally good on that front before you can invest in yourself. And I don't think... Um, you, can, you know, you have to love all yourself before you, in, you invest or whatever, you know, like they, they work together. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's a process and each step forward, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I think the best metaphor is like walking as you take a step with the left foot, your weight is shifting. And then, so there creates a space for you to shift back to the right. So I think that's the, the, the back and forth between self-love and investing. They, they work together. And as then you, then you, reach a new destination through that balance of both of them. Is that, is that a good answer to your question? It, I'm sure, I it, hope I got it. It is. Yeah. No, you answered the question. And I guess um, a, digging a little bit deeper, though, is do you find that you can invest in yourself more and more the more that you, you know, love yourself or find those parts of yourself because you find it opens up more creative outlets or things like that? Uh, yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. The more you the more you love yourself, the more you sort of, and I'm not talking about like, uh, and I'm sure probably most of your listeners know this, but it's not like I'm in love with myself. Like it's not like I'm in love with who I am, you know, kind of thing, or, you know, my image or whatever. Like it's more about like just, it's just being like in a, in a place of peace with myself and acceptance um, and, and wholeness and integrity within myself is when I, when I'm talking about self-love or, or, and then that leads to uh, the investment that leads to I'm worthy of going after my dreams. I'm worthy of these things. And they do they do speed each other up. They do lead to more and more growth. And eventually what I have found is that the more you do this, it's not about, you know, investing in myself and growing and then uh, it's just so I can have more for me. It's like the more you do this, actually, the more you want to connect and share with and give with others. Um, but it, that's where it comes back to the, where you quoted my newsletter about authentic giving, that comes from that foundation then that is, is solid and is uh, sustainable. So that's what I call an authentic gift is, is coming from that place of wholeness where you love yourself, you're in an integrity with yourself, and you're on this journey of investing and loving and investing and loving so that you can continue to authentically give. And I know that I saw some people who had some questions and, and I've been asked the questions too, like, how do you know when you're authentically giving to someone versus, um, you know, am I doing it for, um, you know, something in return? Even even some people are like, oh, well, sometimes you want to, you know, a thank you or something. But for me, authentic giving for me is I take a moment before I, I do anything and I say, what is my goal for this? Do I give with no expectation. If I do, then I'm not going to do it. And I look at giving as an investment into the things that I believe in, or the things that I, you know, I'm inspired by or things like that. So can you maybe uh, expand on that a little bit, like how, how you are able to say, okay, I'm giving authentically versus touching that point going, mm, am I not for those people who, who have yeah. questions on that? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so it comes down to like in that moment when you're thinking about giving somebody a gift, um, there is, you can feel it. I, I, I kind of go into the feeling space uh, just in my heart of like, you know, do I expect something out of this? Is there a tightness around my heart? Do I feel the social pressure that if I don't give, I'm going to be judged? Um, you know, when I was, when I was younger, I loved giving gifts and I loved Christmas and I loved, you know, when I was a kid, I would book a lot of different TV commercials and I loved bringing home some of the toys and giving them to my siblings. And I loved that because it wasn't expected. And, and then it got to a point where in my life, I was thinking about Christmas and different holidays and such. And I was like, you know what, there's this, we're losing this, the, the authenticness of giving. And I remember one Christmas I said to my family, I said, can we just like, what if we just didn't give each other gifts and we went out and we contributed something to the local community? Like we did a food, a food thing, like where we made food for people that didn't have any food or whatever. And so I think that's where you can get into the traps of expectations and pressures and that tightness in your heart when you're giving that kind of, to me, spoils, spoils the gift. There's, there's such a beauty and a magnificence. And I know people out there listening will probably have a circumstance or many circumstances in their life where they have given authentically. And it feels so good. It is just effortless in that sense of it's just like this liberating feeling. And then the response or the reaction or, or the, um, the receiver of that gift, there's a difference in, in how it is accepted and how it is seen. And, and, and that, like, that's what I talk about in the newsletter. It's, it's a ripple effect that will transcend anything you could contrive or anything you could try and expect from that gift. And so getting to that place of, of giving authentically is just, for me, is just being present with yourself, being, um, having that space to listen and go, you know, am I trying to coerce this person? Am I trying to put a social pressure on them? Am I trying to get brownie points? You know, and just being honest with yourself, you will see what will bubble up is if there is anything going on, you'll see it. And you can shed it and let it go and say, okay, maybe, maybe this isn't necessary. Um, sometimes I, I want to be super generous um, and I can feel it in myself. I'm like, oh, Graham, you're trying to be generous because you want approval. So I have to just scale it back and be like, okay, what does the situation actually call for? What does this person actually need? And, and see it for the situation in front of you as opposed to um, trying to make it something that you can get a feeling out of of like, you know what I'm saying? Like take from, take from it. Like, oh, I feel so good. I gave so much money or I, I gave this person this gift and now they should, they should thank me in, in, a, in a really good way and then I'll get that sort of connection that I crave. And so just being honest with yourself is, is the process and you'll know by how you feel after and, and if you have these expectations or assumptions that come up, then, then that's the process of, of diving into yourself and just sort of noticing, ah, look, I really wanted their approval. I really wanted them to uh, connect with me. And so by, by separating those two, you can actively go and connect with that person and then give authentically or give authentically and then afterwards go and connect with that person. And that way you're not confusing the two and you're not mixing them and you can really um, contribute in a way that's authentic and has that power of that magnification and that ripple effect of, of authentic giving. So um, the short answer is just feel it out for yourself. You'll know. Good answer. Um, you were talking about being present with yourself, so I'm going to switch the gears a little bit on there. Um, I know you've talked a lot about uh, you meditate. You like to go into the the forest. Um, you'll, you'll say the forest is my church. I think you said on an interview with Ivory. Um, and you, you, you're you very open about that, um, all the different practices that you have. So for people who maybe struggle or... Um, or have a hard time with that connecting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about nature because because you do go into nature a lot. So can you uh, can you elaborate on that? Like when do you do you have a point where you're you know you're so busy and and right now you you live in an area where it's easier for you to access you know that nature. But if you're in a situation where it may be not so easy, how do you do you feel like a feeling going? I have to reconnect and. And how do you, how do you get there? 
So in the circumstances where I'm not surrounded by nature, how do I do that? Or even even when you are, like do you like you you do podcasting, so you sit and you edit and you do all that and you're in front of your computer. And do you get to a point where you go, okay, I have to go outside. I have to connect with nature. I have to uh. put my feet on the ground type of thing. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, and every morning I go for a walk and um, just be outside, breathe the fresh air, look at the trees, hear the birds. Um, yeah, it's, it's important uh, to kind of do that rebalancing. It's, it's like, um, you know how you can feel when you're hungry? You know, and if you're really, if you're really stressed out, you're really busy. Sometimes you kind of forget that. I don't know. That's what happens to me sometimes. Um, but then I'm like, oh, what's? Go oh, I'm hungry. Or and I get the same sort of similar type of feeling if I haven't been outside in a long time. Uh, I'm like, I just, I need to be outside. I need to be in the trees. I need to be in the water. You know, um, it's a feeling similar to hunger, where it's there's an imbalance or there's this aching. Um, and it's kind of, in terms of the nature piece, it's more of like an aching in my soul. And then once I get out into the woods, uh, specifically the woods, uh, the forest, I, t I take these big, deep breaths and it's like, it's like backpacks of weight coming off me. Um, so for me, that's, that's why I like the forest and that's why I call it my church or my home because it's, it's the best place for my soul. <laughs> and when you're, <laughs> when you're, me. <laughs> and when you go like I love to hike and be out in nature as well but I find that I like I just can't just walk I mean you can breathe and do that and it's fine but like I have to sometimes like you know touch the trees feel that oh yeah hug trees and all ground the time. okay okay I was gonna ask you do you ever do that do you ever take your take your shoes off and and be like I'm just gonna let myself be one with nature oh of course um my last time I was out in the forest there um, I didn't take off my shoes. It was a little chilly, but I did hug lots of trees. I'll often just kind of like pat the tree, kind of like I'm, I'm like, it's like my friend and I'm like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> and then I'll <laughs> lean against it and I'll hug it. Um, yeah. And then, uh, the other day, um, I, uh, bought a, a wetsuit and I was like, I'm going to test this wetsuit out. And I went out into the ocean and, um, just bobbed in the ocean. Cause in a wetsuit, you kind of like, you it's like a natural flotation, like you just kind of bob. And I just sat in the ocean and bobbed, and there's some sea otters that poked their heads up, like, uh, you know, a few feet away from me, and like, hey, what are you doing out here? <laughs> <laughs> and it was great. It was a very um, calming and cleansing thing to reconnect. Um, but yeah, the world that we live in now is, you know, in my, my life specifically, lots of, lots of computer time, lots of screen time, and uh, the stuff that I like to produce and like to put out there and share with people has to come you know, it's something that I, I really aspire to. It has to come from an inspired place, a connected place. And so I, I make that a priority to spend time in nature so that what I do create and where I come from is that sustainable place is that, you know, because that's where it's, we are a part of this earth. We are a part of this life, all these different living organisms, right? So it's easy to forget that when we're stuck in front of digital screens. So you got to reconnect. Uh, something that I really love that you do as well is you, um, when you present things or when you're, when you are online, you keep things, you present a very positive uh, vision and you promote a lot of love and unity and things like that. And is that hard at all times sometimes because life isn't always good grin, you know, and, and a lot of times, as you know, everyone's trying to sell fear. So why is that important for you to make yourself like present things positively in a positive way? Yeah. Um, I, I, I've seen the other side, Lori, <laughs> I've seen that this is all love and I've seen that this is just consciousness experiencing itself. I was very blessed to have an experience. Uh, like I've explained in my podcast where I, I got a, a brief connection to the love that connects us all. And I can't unknow that. I know that's the way it is. And once I, I saw that, it was like, well, of course it's this way. Like, how else could it be? And so fear and the darkness or the unconscious, the unconsciousness of humanity and, and the, the process that we're going through of growing up and maturing, it's not always pretty. But um, I do have compassion for the challenging things that people are going through and the fear and, and what comes up. And I still experience it to, to my, for myself to some degree as well until I, oh, what am I doing? Snap out of that. Um, but 
it's important for me to present as best I can uh, the positive element because that's the truth. Um, it's not ignoring and saying it's only positive. I'm just saying that everything is love and we are just experiencing the, you know, it's like um, there's no such thing as darkness. There's only an absence of light. Like light is the only thing that actually exists and there's just an absence of it in which we, we think is darkness. And so it seems like a trivial thing, but when you apply that to life, it's everything is love. It's just there are some things that are, there are absences of it or there's less of it, but it's still all love. So that's a fundamental foundation for me. So when I present information and I try and speak up about what's going on in the world, um, I think that is the most beneficial thing that I can do. Um, but I also, you know, raise concerns. I also raise things that I think are really serious, um, that it's maybe not necessarily like, it's like the equivalent of like there was a, uh, if you were about to, if you were in a car and you are, you are driving and you're not paying attention to the road and you're slowly drifting off to the side, it's like, yes, this is all love, but hey, you should pay attention. You got to correct your course here a bit or you're going to hit a tree. And, you know, that, that might not be what you want right now. So there, there, is, there is a place and a time and a place for some corrective <laughs> a commentar commentary or a concern to be expressed. But uh, I do my best to not use fear as a way to get attention um, as best I can um, because ultimately I know that this experience is, is all love and we're just here to continue the expansion of consciousness and explore and have an adventure and learn. Good answer. And uh, you kind of touched on uh, something else that I, when you were talking about um, uh, sharing important world events and things. So, uh, you've always said to everyone, it's really important to do your own research. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually wanted to ask you a couple things since this is lead way into here. Um, you are insanely intelligent. And um, anyone who's ever asked you a good question, <laughs> um, you will, when you're thinking, you will like bite your lip and you get this blind look and it's like a Rolodex is going off in your head, like finding that information. So I want to ask you, how do you retain so much information? And do you have like a photographic memory? And like, it's not just general, like you, you'll say, oh, I don't know a whole lot about this, but then you can go on like a 10 minute tangent for something. So how do you retain so much information? <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Laurie, for, for your compliment there. Um, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, I sometimes think I can't hold, like, I'm like, oh man, like I can't hold any information in my head until I try and explain it to somebody. And then I'm like, oh, actually, I, I, there is a lot in there stuck in there. It's just I don't always see it. Um, how do I retain information? Well, learning is state-based. What I've learned is that, um, you know, in, in, in school, when you were sitting in school, you're sitting there stationary, and it's hot in the room, and you're like, your teacher's just drowning on this monotone voice. It's very hard to retain information. On the flip side, if you have a teacher that is uh, active and, and engaging and they're energetic and they're having fun, and you're allowed to move your body, and there's an interaction with you and the teacher, and there's, you know, um, the teacher's asking students to, to, you know, call out their answers, to write things down. There's different techniques that allow you to retain more information, and the best one I've found is passion. So if you're excited about something, and you're able to move your body, you're going to, I think there's, there's studies, I think it's like 80 to 90% of better retention than if you just sit there and passively listen. So for me, I have a natural curiosity and I, I want to learn not for the sake of being an expert or seeing, being seen as somebody who knows a lot of things, but I genuinely love learning about the patterns in life. So I love watching and learning about so many different things because there's always patterns and the patterns that supersede the specific activity is what I find fascinating. Um, there are principles as well that, that supersede the, the, the area of focus. And for me, that's what I yearn for. That's what I'm passionate about is because the more I can see and understand those patterns that operate above all the different subject matters or the areas of focus, then I start to see the common sort of truth that connects all things. So I might not know a terrible amount 
about a specific issue, but the things that I do know follow those patterns that relate to other things in life. And I think that's very valuable because um, I want to be able to connect with and appreciate all the aspects of life, whether I have the time to dive into them or not. And I have found that, you know, by being passionate about the principles of life, the principles of, of how things work and the patterns of how things work, you start to see the beauty and the magnificence of all of life in every different facet, whether it be from engineering to cryptocurrencies to dance and music. Uh, it, it, they all have these overarching themes and patterns that are truth, are of, well, of course, how else could it work? And so that's what excites me and that's what I, I'm passionate about and that's what helps me just learn along with, like I said, using my body. I'm, I'm Italian, I have Italian blood in me, so I'm always using my hands and expressing myself. <laughs> um, so those are, those are some tools for, for how to better retain things. Also, I, I did a, a speed reading course, uh, and one of the things they said is to prime your brain with questions. And I, of course, that makes so much sense. So often in school, you, you do the reading comprehension part, and then after you read the questions, you have to try and remember what you just read. Well. Jim Quick teaches this, uh, his name is Jim Quick, and he teaches this course about speed reading, and he says you read the questions first. Prime your brain first with what it's supposed to pay attention to, then go read the comprehension part. So often when I'm reading a book, and that's what he talks about, you know, for in terms of reading a book, he says, it, it, ask yourself some high quality questions, and your brain will be use, using the reticular activating uh, system, I think it's called, um, to pay attention to uh, those details that you're looking for, as opposed to um, not having a question in mind. Often we just not using our mind to its fullest capacity. So understanding the power of questions, understanding the focus, understanding how to use your physiology to improve your your retention and your learning and implementation of what you're you're absorbing. It's like, yeah, like it's awesome. <laughs> you mentioned before too that you um, you sp like would speed up the videos. Do you still do that? T take in more all the time. All the time. It's very rare that I watch a video on on, on regular speed. Uh, if it's an experience, that's why I try to make my podcast like an experience where it's like you, it's you kind of like I want people to kind of go into like a dreamlike state. Um, if it's a if it's a movie or if it's an experience, I will never speed that up. If it's information for learning, I almost never watch it at regular speed. I watch it at one point five to one point seven five, sometimes two 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 times speed. Um, just just. Come on, get through it. Um, <laughs> and, and then sometimes I have to, you know, slow it down just because, you know, this person actually speaks fast. But I find most people, they speak very slowly um, because, you know, they're coming up with their thoughts like I am now. So uh, speeding it up a bit uh, helps just kind of move it along. <laughs> do you uh, do that? Do you watch videos at double speed or anything? I, I sometimes do. I... It depends. It depends on what I'm I'm taking in because most of the times I'm doing like documentaries and things like that. So I, I want to hear like really take in the information. Um, and so I I'm a little bit weird, like in the sense that, um, you know, you talked in one of your podcast episodes how, uh, you know, you can like hear your, your thoughts. I don't hear my thoughts. So for me, when I process information, like it's really odd hearing myself in my headphones right now. Because for me, when I get information in there, it's like reading a book. Like I see words, but I don't hear in my head. Oh, interesting. So I, I think I'm a weirdo because it, there's just, I, I, I see. So as I'm talking or things like that, it's, it's words. Like I see words and I can pick them out, but I don't hear myself in there. Like there's no noise. Oh, so when you're meditating, you see words and see pictures and things as opposed to hearing a voice? It, yeah, if I'm like, if I'm thinking, you know, like, as I'm talking to you, like I can, it's like the words popping in my head, like I can see them up there. It's like reading a can book. Can you hear them as well? Or just, do no. you just see them? No. So it's been very You're like deaf. You're deaf yeah. in your mind. <laughs> it's been very weird. Because I'm like, Oh, I don't like my voice when I hear it in the, in the headphones. Because oh, yeah. I'm like, that's what you sound like. Yeah. So it's, it's weird. Interesting. Do you, do you sound I think like you told me this? Do you sound like you sound when in your head? Uh, do I like sound like, like Carrie James on your podcast episode said that he had like I think there was an accent on his in his mind brain. <laughs> uh, yeah, the voice in my head. 
it's, it, does it sound like me? Yes, it sounds like me. But when I pay attention to it, I'm like, oh man, sometimes it's super negative or sometimes it's super like, why would you think that? It's not even my thoughts, you know, they're just, they're just, so the concept that I have recently been come familiar with is, you know, sometimes the thoughts that go through your head or the ideas, they're not even yours. They're, you're, they're programming from the media or just out in the atmosphere, like a radio signal, your brain just tunes into them. And then the voice in my head just kind of spits them out. And I'm like, that's not what I feel at all. So, you know, just let that fly through me. But um, yeah, I think it sounds like me. It's hard to, it's, it's not, it's not like I, maybe I don't hear it. It's more just I'm aware of it. Um, it's not the same as hearing. It's more like it's just, I just become aware of it, but I don't see words. So maybe that means I'm hearing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm you must. Sure. Every, every time I tell people that, they're like, what did you just say to me? And I'm like, I don't hear. I'm like, I, I guess I'm weird. I don't know. Whatever unique. It is. You're unique. <laughs> <laughs> you were just talking, though, about, um, you know, you'll hear, like, in, in your head, uh, you know, thoughts, negative thoughts or things like that. And I want to ask you about that, too. Um, you know, sometimes we think about ourselves and and will I saw this quote from someone if if you talked about yourself or the way that you talked about yourself if you had a friend that talked to you like that would you still be friends with that person mm -hmm. or how long would you be friends with that person for um is that something that you have struggled with in the past or is that like are you now that you're more like in tune and comfortable with yourself you really don't have those negative thoughts that oh, come through oh, as no, much? no 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 no, they come up. I mean, yeah, not as much, but they do come up. Um, yeah, uh, positive self-talk is a great uh, practice, uh, like you said, about you know treating yourself like you would treat your best friend or a child. Um, and then would you talk to your own child that way, or would you, you know, a best friend allow you, would you allow a best friend to talk to you that way? Um, those are great sort of like reflecting points um, to sort of, you know, just become aware of that voice. And a, a lot of us, and myself included, you know, it's, it's habitual. You don't even realize that you're doing it. It's just so, you're just so used to it happening that you accept it. And then once you become aware of it through meditation or just through, you know, asking yourself the question, uh, you can go, oh, wait, whoa, this isn't how I want to treat myself. And that comes back to the self-love thing, right? And, and accepting of yourself and seeing yourself as worthy of love and, and your own love for that matter. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's a process, and I still am working on it. I think it's an ongoing thing, uh, a refining process. It's uh, that's the journey of life. You're never going to reach the destination, but you always keep moving forward. So, I mean, eventually Are we're going to die, but I don't think life's <laughs> over. Like I think after that, there's going to be another one. Like I don't think. Yeah, there was an Alan Watts. Do you know who Alan Watts is? I do. Yes. Yeah. So Alan Watts is one of my favorite speakers, teachers. And, uh, you know, he talks about like, you don't remember when you, when this life started, it just started like at some point it started, but you don't remember when it started. Right. And so it can't, if it doesn't have a distinct beginning, it can't have a distinct end. Like it can't end. He was saying this, this is how I remember it. And so the way he kind of says is that, you know, being born is like waking up and dying is like going back to sleep, but maybe it's the reverse. Like being born is falling asleep and you're going to this illusion of this, what you think is real. And then when you die, you actually wake up to another reality. So I think life is this ever uh, expanding experience of consciousness, whether you be in a body or out of a body. And so I think you're always growing. I think you're always learning. And I think you're always uh, mastering those elements of, of consciousness, whether it be thought patterns, negative things, or uh, emotions, whatever the case may be. I think it's an it's an ongoing journey that I'm happy to be a part of. <laughs> Are you able to, um, now that you've done a lot of your self work though, and like you said, it's, it's, it's a constant process, but are you able to catch yourself? Uh, I, it used to take me a while, uh, but now like I'll know, like I'll start to hear it come in and I'm like, hold on, stop, stop right there. And you talked about that. I think kind of, um, when you were like, I try not to pass judgment on things, but I got to ask about that too, because how quick are you able to, to say, okay, I'm, I'm making a judgment here and I got to stop because everyone makes judgments. I, I mean, I, I, it's a feeling. I just, yeah. So I just go into like this, uh, it's like a, a thermometer. Like, you know, when you get cold in your room and you're like, oh, it's cold in here. Like I got to turn up the heat. 
It's the same thing with judgments. It's like, as soon as I feel myself energetically going into that sort of hardened state of like, oh, screw that guy, or like, what an idiot, or like, whatever. It's, a, it's like a temperature change. And I just go, oh, I'm not going there. It's not doing it. And then I'll just rewrite the, the um, you know, the perspective or the story. And I'll say, bless that person. Or I'll say, hey, I don't know what they're going through. And it's, you know, I'm not, obviously it's not all the time like this, but that's just my practice. Um, and so I just try and maintain uh, that energetic sort of, you know, movement of towards more love and, you know, more expansion and more adventure and, and whatnot. Uh, and if I feel myself going to judgment, uh, I can feel it energetically. It's like, it's like a heaviness. And um, I'll just, I'll just, I'll say, whoa, Graham, <laughs> what are you doing, man? Like, let it, let that go. Uh, so that's, that's my way of, of um, catching myself. And uh, yeah, I still, I still struggle uh, with it. Um, but, but that's, that's, that's my barometer or my temperature gauge is I just kind of use how I'm feeling. And if I'm, if it feels, and I'm not talking about like discernment, like, oh, like that's an unfortunate circumstance or that's something that I wouldn't do myself. That's one thing versus what an idiot, like that's the judgment part where, and then energetically, I go down and then I'm like, I don't want to be there. So I just shift it as best I can. So you catch yourself quit doing it quicker now though? Yeah, much quicker than before. I mean, I think it was Dr. Joe Dispenza who talked about attitudes, you know, someone has an attitude after a bad day and then maybe that attitude for lasts for like a week and then like, oh, they're just, you know, they just went through something. And then that attitude lasts for like a year and it's like, well, that's just who they are. <laughs> and so people get stuck in judgments or attitudes, um, those energetic states. And if you don't shift them, then that becomes people just say, oh, that's just the way they are. You know, they're really aggressive or they're really moody or they might bite your head off, you know? And so it's just understanding that you always have the power and the more awareness you bring to it through, it doesn't have to be meditation. It just be, you know, walk in the woods or just asking yourself journaling. That's, that's how I started was just journaling. And then you start to become aware of these patterns, uh, attitudes, uh, judgments or whatever. And then you are given a choice. You can let it go or you can keep it. It's up to you. Um, and then I always ask myself, what's, how does this impact my life? You know, if I want to hold on to this judgment, how is that going to make me feel? Do I feel good? Well, I might judge another person to make myself feel better because I feel insecure, but ultimately that's not going to do me any good because it's not, you know, that's not true. So it's just being honest with yourself. That's the last poem in my book is be honest with yourself and the rest is easy. And it's like all, all, what did I say? All something or spiritual, all fears. All fears. Spiritual yeah. yeah, you know it. <laughs> I know it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's All my fears are spiritual one. revelations hidden behind your efforts to control the world. So, um, yeah, that's how I see it. Awesome. Um, I want to uh, shift gears just a little bit. And I want to go back uh, a little bit on, um, because I know integrity is really, really big to you. And we had touched a little bit on uh, doing your own research when I was asking you about how you retain information. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, something that stuck out to me was in in August, you had, I, I can't remember the exact date, but I know it was in August, you had shared something online and um, and you had, uh, I'm, I'm going to say made a judgment, and you came back and corrected yourself when you found out that the information was wrong. And... I want to ask, why was that important to you? Because a lot of people would have just deleted it and said, ah, whatever, I got it wrong. Uh, because uh, a, a long time ago, I learned the power of your word. So by keeping your, your promises with yourself, by honoring your word with yourself and others, it strengthens your word and your word becomes like a superpower. So the more you honor yourself, the more you honor your word, the more you have integrity, the more power that that has. So the by not correcting that or saying oh i made a mistake uh you know i apologize this is what really goes on then i basically poke a hole in the boat of my integrity or the power of my word it's literally like a superpower if you do what you say you're going to do and in in the uh and the hardest thing to do to, to follow up with is just with yourself when you have no one else holding you accountable just doing what you say you're going to do because you said you're going to do it 
it gives your word more power. And then, you know, doing that with other people and your relationships and in your work as well, it gives it more power so that when you say you're going to do something, it has the history and the momentum and the weight. And it's like a, a winning streak in a, in a sense where it's like you, you want to continue that power because it, um, it can, you can create with that. And it's a very powerful thing. So in terms of sharing content online, I know that a lot of the content I've shared, um, I do my best to share as authentically and as honestly as I can. And if there's something that I pass a judgment on or I feel uh, that I have crafted a perspective that later is proven to be, oh, that's not true, I have to go and correct it as best I can because um, I devalue my, my word with myself and with others. And that is linked back to integrity and I'm not just saying integrity because I want to, you know, want to be all goody goody. It's just more like you're a Jedi, like you're a, you're like a superhero that have these powers. And once you learn how to wield them, it's like magic can happen. So why wouldn't you want to have, you know, that powerful, you know, superpower to be able to create things? And and I'm, you know, we're speaking about sharing information, you know, necessary, uh, it's particular to what's going on in the world, but this, it applies across the board. So if you want to create a podcast, if you want to do, start a new business, if you want to do whatever, your word has power. And if you always say things to your friends like, oh yeah, I'm going to do this. And then you never do it. Or yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to get so strong and whatever. But you, you don't take that daily action of putting on your gym clothes and just going for a walk. You, you devalue your word. And then on the flip side of that, the more you honor your word and the more you actually do what you say you're gonna do, the more power it has. And then you can say, I'm gonna create a business. And there's no doubt in your mind and it happens and you find a way. So to me, that's exciting. And that's why I'm, uh, I am passionate uh, and, and committed to doing my very best in terms of integrity and, and what I do share, correcting any inaccuracies as best I can. And I'm still gonna make mistakes, I know that. but correct them as soon as you can so that you can maintain for yourself and for others the, the power of your word. And I think a lot of people overlook that. So that's why it's important to me to do it. Well, I think that that's great because uh, especially now in, in the world, like a, a lot of people just don't do that. So I, I find that very admirable. And I when you did it, I was like, wow, that's really that's really cool that you went back and corrected yourself for that because what was it what was it for again it was like that video of the child getting taken away or something it was in the in the uh it was in it was in Australia and it was the the child and the police were taken away but the yeah. the context someone had yeah. put the wrong context for it yeah I think it was around like August 10th I'm trying to remember the yeah, exact date but yeah yeah it was like they were separating children from their parents or something because of the, the jab or whatever. I, I think that's what it was, the context that was that was false. And it was more about like some sort of parental thing or it was like a custody of the child. I can't remember. But yeah, the context was wrong. And the emotions were so high at that time, people were so afraid. And I saw it and my emotions got the best of me. And I was just, I was frustrated with the, the, the world. And I was just like, and I that was where, I, I can't tell you how many times, Lori, I've seen stuff and I've been like this close to hitting send. And I'm like, no. Just relax, just sit on it. And I've been so glad. That was one of the times, one of the very few times that I was just, I was really upset. And I, I pushed send before I had really verified it a few times. And uh, even some people that I thought would have verified it, like journalists, put it out there. And I reached out to them after and they were like, oh, I didn't verify it. And I was like, you're a journalist. <laughs> How did you not verify that? So I trusted people before verifying it for myself, thinking that they were a journalist. So that must mean that they would have verified it, but um, you gotta be careful. And, and that's kind of goes back to paying attention to your gut. Like same thing we were talking about earlier about judgments or gifts, gift giving. It's all about tuning in and just being like, you can, it's so subtle, but the more you can real, you can feel it and tune into it. It's like this very subtle feeling. You can be like, ah, I'm a little too emotional about this or there's something I'm missing here. In that moment, I was upset and I, I just hit send and then I had to go back and correct. Because well, it wasn't I'm true. I'm glad that you did. And I, um, with the doing your own research portion, I know um, you were, when you started speaking out, you did not jam it down people's throats. Um, you were, you shared things sporadically at first. And 
I know I told you I was really mad at you when you did that. I was like, <laughs> what is he doing? And um, recently at one of our things that our freedom meetups that we have, uh, I ran into someone I knew and they were like, what are you doing here? You're the last person on the earth I'd ever thought would be here. And so they basically said, you know, how, if you would change, how would, how would anybody else change? And I said, well, if anyone has to go my journey, then <laughs> good luck to everybody. Because I got so mad and I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start researching on my own. And forget it. Once I started doing that, I was like, oh, well, maybe he's not so wrong. So was it harder not to just be like, okay, I'm going to jam everything at everybody versus giving things slowly for information that you have shared? Yeah, the it kind of boils down to the goal. And so the goal for me was, I'm not doing this, I'm not sharing these things because I want to be popular, or I want to be the first guy to share them or to like, you guys are idiots. Look what's actually going on. Uh, it was, this is really uh, uh, concerning and dangerous, and we need to be aware of this, but I'm aware, I'm also aware that a majority of people um, aren't ready to hear this. So my strategy was, how do you move the metaphorical football down the field um, without ruining the platforms that I have to share a message. So uh, my, my effective goal was to get as many people to ask a question because we weren't allowed, to, we still aren't to some degree, ask questions. And anything in life that is immediately shunned or you are judged for asking a question, uh, I, I get red flags. I'm like, why can't we ask questions about this? Like, I'm okay to be wrong. I'm okay to be, you know, educated about why this question may be not a valid question or I'm missing some context for sure. But why am I not allowed to ask a question? So once the sort of the pressure came in that you had to do what everybody else was doing and there was a social pressure to cast out anybody who questioned it, I was like, I don't play these games. I've never played these games and I will never play these games because I know there's something else going on. So I took the approach of slowly trying to just create a little space around, hey, what about this? Um, you know, the first picture I, I posted um, of me in a uh, freedom rally or a march, um, you know, my comments were about love. My comment was about talk to your neighbor. My comment was like, you know, turn off the news and talk to the people around you. See what's really going on. Um, I'm not saying I'm not saying one thing is false or true. I'm just sort of because when you come from an empowered place, when you come from a place from within where you're tuning into yourself, you can spot the lies a mile away. <laughs> but if you're not, it's very easy to get swept up. So that was my approach was to start with the sort of fundamentals that regardless of what's going on in the world is going to be useful and then slowly try and create the space to say, "Hey, maybe we're being you know, scared into things and, you know, coerced into things uh, that are not for our, our the best benefit. And um, that was the, the path that I chose because effectively my goal was to reach as many people as I could that were open to it. And then the people that weren't, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to reach everyone and that's okay. Um, but uh I just had to do my part because I wanted to be able to tell my future children that I did everything I could when I could do it um, as best I could. And how much um, when you're taking in, you know, news and things like that, that you want to share, like how I find that for myself, I have to balance it. So I... I mean, I can pick up right away when I'm like, no, this doesn't feel right on on both. I'm going to say both sides of, of the news spectrum. But how much do you take in of each side to come collectively where you are? Like, is it, do you take in more of one thing? But I would assume that you have to take in an equal amount to be able to balance it and go, okay, this is right. This, this feels right or this doesn't. Mm. I mean, for me, it's... Uh, it's like an eagle. Like I kind of soar as best I can, just kind of, I don't do as much as I used to. 
because I've kind of seen all the similar sort of talking points now and what's going on. Uh, so I can now just kind of uh, relax a bit and kind of zoom out to a wide angle view and kind of see the landscape. Um, what I what I have always gravitated towards is the side that is being told to to shut up, the side that has been told you're a conspiracy theory or you're you're wrong or you should be ashamed and you shouldn't think that way. When I was younger, I was in high school and 9/11 happened, and it was a horrible thing. And my mom woke me up and she says, "Tish, my mom was you know just over the she was she was really upset." And I was like, "I don't even know what's going on. New York, like what's the World Trade Center? I've never even heard of that. I don't even know what that. I have no idea." And um, my aunt, uh, uh, who's now passed away, but she used to work at the Pentagon, and, and my mom was all afraid because you know the Pentagon was hit, and she was okay. But um, anyways, all these things happened, and I remember afterwards, you know, everyone's oh, the world's going to change, the world's going to change, and everything's different now. And and then when people started asking questions, they were immediately. Uh, blamed and shamed and how could you be so inconsiderate of the victims and, and you're, you're being disrespectful and I'm like I, I, I couldn't understand it I was like what are you talking about like it just didn't make sense to me in a, in, a, in a deeper level why can I not question something I can still have reverence and respect for the people that lost their lives whether it be 9-11 or this pandemic or whatever the case a war I can still have respect and reverence for those people that have lost their lives, and I can ask questions. And so um, I've always just sort of, when it comes to taking in the news, I feel out where, where is the people that are being ignored? Because the, the powers that be, the, the, the big cameras and megaphones and, and the big media, they have power. And they, they will always almost effectively, whatever they're choosing not to look at or discredit, it's like that's where I look as well. Because the mainstream narrative is everywhere. So it's very easy to get the mainstream narrative. The harder thing to do is see what's being suppressed. And so, and not everything that's suppressed is true, but there is very often a big seed of truth. And again, like I was talking about earlier about the patterns of life and how I like learning, it's, it's very similar in terms of what's going on in the world. There are patterns of truth and how truth is suppressed. And like, I'm sure you've noticed it and people make memes about it now. It's like, what was a conspiracy theory six months ago is now the news, right? It's yep. just true. And so it's speeding up faster and faster. Like um, the bio labs thing in Ukraine was like, oh, that's a conspiracy. They don't exist. Okay, there might be some research facilities. Okay, there are bio labs. But uh, they're defensive bio labs. It's like the, it's like the the goal like the goalposts are not moving in six months now. It's like a week, right? So things are moving so quickly, um, and that's not to say all the information that goes out there, like I said, that is suppressed is true. And so I just, it's yeah, it's a feeling, Lori. It's a sense of it. It's um, and it's also those patterns of life. And it's not. It's my mom would always say to me. She said, Graham, it's not black and white. It's there's there's she says, your name is Graham. You have gray in your name. There are shades of gray. It's not black and white. Um, and so I, I think that's very helpful sometimes when looking at the news or looking at people. And it's very easy to get polarized in perspectives and judging people as, you know, right winger or left winger extremist to whatever degree. And it's like we're all human beings trying to figure this out. And it's very easy to get emotionally charged and then push against the other person. But um, you know, effectively, we all want uh, these these same things. We all struggle with these same things, and we're all just using different methods to achieve them. And so, even issues that I am strongly opposed to, I have compassion for the people that are pushing those issues because I I can see it at a seed root of what's actually going on. There's actually something there that they do have a point. I don't agree with how they're going about it. And then, if we, I feel like if we can detach ourselves from the, it has to be my way and this way to solve this issue and instead go, do we agree on this issue? Do we agree on this, this, is a, this, this common thorn or challenge? Um, can we get to the root of where we agree? And from there we can build something. But if we're always trying to pick each other apart with what we, how we are different, we're going to remain divided and that's how we are easily controlled. So um, that's why I find it's important to 
whoever I'm speaking with or how, whoever I'm trying to connect with is just, you know, find the commonality, find the things that we do agree on and build upon that. Um, and we're not agree, we're going to agree on everything. That's the beauty of life. Human beings are, you know, diverse and we have different ways of seeing life and that's great. Um, I love that. Um, so, uh, long answer to your, your, uh, specific question about how to pay attention to news. Do I absorb left and right? Yes. Just more of an, a zoomed out, uh, view and I feel it. I can, you can feel it when people are, when, um, and it's not just feel it in terms of someone's emotional, like, uh, do you see that uh, video of that woman talking about the babies in incubators and they were throwing the babies out of the incubators on the ground? This is what justified, a, I think it was the Kuwait war. And it turned out that never happened. She was coached. That actually, that speech in front of Congress or whatever it was, you can look it up, babies in incubators speech for Kuwait. Uh, later came out that that never happened. And she was emotional and she was telling the story of what she saw. And it was an act, it wasn't real. And so I'm not saying feel it out in terms of if this person is emotional, it must be true because there's lots of things that people get emotional about. doesn't mean it's true. And so you kind of have to really relax. Not like, it's, like a, it's like you're watching a movie. When you're watching a horror movie and you're getting too, like you're getting too scared, my strategy is I just look at the ground or I, like, I look at the corner of the screen and then I'm like, oh, right, I'm in a movie. And so similar to the news and stuff, it's just like just allow yourself to relax a bit similar to like meditation, just relax and don't get too wrapped up in the emotion because that's how this sort of narrative machine steers our perspective is they get us wrapped up in the emotion, charged up, and then they point the finger at the enemy. And then we jump into wars and do all these crazy things that Sorry, I went on a rant. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. You, I, I actually, you answered another question that I had about people getting so um, uh, consumed with, with you know, different perspectives. But the only thing that I, I want to ask you about is when you said, you know, the the common goal is everyone can disagree or whatever, but um, you know, respect each other type of deal. But something that I found, especially this past year, is that. Um, you saw very prevalently people on the right side were getting censored more and they were getting uh, shadow banned and removed. Why do you really think um, or what, how do you think that we can come to that common goal when people really just want to shut other people up and the extremes that they've gone to do that? I know there was a, um, uh, a gentleman I follow, uh, Ingo, he was on General Hospital for 25 years. He's um, he's suing ABC over the the mandates. Um, and I saw um, uh, the other day people had made a post and they were like, uh, "Oh, look at him! He went out with this sheriff who um, is a he was big on not upholding the mandates." And they were like, "He better never work again." So um, you know, he's been very outspoken and he's gone on and, and he's, he's done, I think it was Tucker Carlson and he, he's friends with RFK. He, d he promotes him a lot. But when people just want to cancel people who have an opposing viewpoint, how do we, how do we come together? Yeah. Um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, so I use the metaphor of, you know, going out to a park and there's a basketball court and, a bunch of guys are playing basketball and I show up with a soccer ball and I, and I'm, I want to play soccer. And they're saying, Hey, well, this is basketball court. You got to play basketball here. I'm like, well, I want to play soccer. So, okay. So what do we do? Well, maybe you take half the court and you play soccer over there with your friends and we'll play basketball over here. So you kind of have different operating systems, right? And then there's the, the discussion of maybe someone plays basketball from a different country and they, you're allowed to take four steps when you're holding the ball as opposed to three. Um, so there are different rules and ways of operating. And yes, we wanna be inclusive and incorporate people to have everybody be able to have fun and play a game. But we also have to understand that as we shift the rules, there are consequences. So if we wanna shift the rules of, of free speech and censorship and shutting people down that we don't like, there are consequences to those rules. And if we're gonna do that, um, it shouldn't be done out of you know this emotional charge or, you know, um, very quickly and hastily because we really have to understand, hey, um, I personally believe in free speech. I think that's very, very important. But if somebody wants to debate and talk about why we shouldn't have it anymore and why this is 
a, we should have a rational conversation about why free speech is dangerous. And if we continue with free speech, then we're all going to this game that we are playing of life. It's all going to collapse. Then let's have that conversation and let's have that place to understand. And, and so that we could all be on the same page and go, yes, you know what? After we've talked about it, we can see how free speech is actually very dangerous and it's, it's much more valuable for us to give the power uh, to, to the government or to some sort of all-powerful sovereign to dictate to us what can and can't be said. But that should be something that we, we sit down and talk about, not just get emotionally charged about. So how do we bring people together when they're doing things like canceling people, like you said, and, and this, this sort of like, it's almost like there is no middle ground. Um, I, I mean, to that extent, yeah, there has to be a, a consequence and a, a set of rules, and we have to agree on those rules. And if you don't agree with those rules, then you're free to go and start your own um, organization or place where free speech is not allowed. But we do have to have a certain set of principles that we agree upon to, to live together. Otherwise, it goes back to guns and swords and you, you know, you made fun of my wife, I'm going to stab you, you know, like, uh, so we just regress, right? So we do have things that work. It's just, um, and we have made progress. It's not perfect and we're continuing that progress. And so when it comes to free speech and canceling people, um, we have to make the argument and make it rationally, respectfully, that this is worth uh, having free speech, the challenges or the, you know, the, the, the people that use free speech to attack other people or, or bully them. It's like, we do have laws against inciting violence, so we don't have to worry about that because there already is laws about this. Um, but getting your feelings hurt, um, that is not, in my, in my mind, uh, a violation of the law and you should be put in jail for that. There's, a, there's real consequences to going down that path. And I don't think a lot of these people who are advocates of that have actually thought about that. They are, and this is where I talk about the seed of truth, they're, they're just really upset that nothing has been done. Similar to how I shared some information that wasn't true because I was really upset. And then afterwards I was like, you know what? That was inaccurate, I have to correct that. I feel like a lot of people, and I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to debate this with people or have conversations with people about this, but I feel like a lot of people that are against this free speech idea uh, and canceling people, they're, they're very emotionally frustrated with the state of the world and, and the situation uh, of you know our our society, and so they're looking for uh, really uh, dramatic changes to try and get some sort of justice or equal equality or or whatnot, and um, and they sort of grab onto these 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 ideas that are dangerous, but they're so desperate that they're going to try something. They're going to try anything. So uh, I think we're, and I'm not, <laughs> this is just my thoughts and I just, you know, I don't know, I haven't studied this in school, but this is just my, what resonates with me and how I feel we should approach this and I'm always learning. But I think that there has to be a very definite line in the sand. This is how we choose to live in a society. We choose to have free speech. We choose to have um you know, you have the right to choose what goes in your body. No one else can tell you that. Um, there are certain principles that we have to agree upon. And it's like, uh, it's like a, you know, it's like a child growing up in the, in, in the house and, and the parents say, I'm sorry, Jimmy, you can't do crack cocaine in the basement. Jimmy's like, but I want to do crack cocaine in the basement. It's like, okay, Jimmy, if you want to do crack cocaine, you got to move. I'm not going to put a roof over your head and, and feed you if you're gonna do crack cocaine, that's the rule. And as much as you wanna be free and independent, I respect you, it's your life journey. If you're gonna do that, you gotta leave. Um, hopefully your child isn't doing crack cocaine, it's a really extreme example, but I'm, I'm basically saying there has to be boundaries, there has to be rules. And so in, in the case of the gentleman you were talking about of you know being canceled because he was speaking out about the mandates, um, I, I just think people are really emotional and the news, media, I have, I have been blown away. I was so surprised how powerful they are. And the more and more I look at this, I, there was a gentleman, Lori, at the, uh, I was at the, in a parking lot, and he asked me about my podcast van, and we were talking about it, and nice man, and we were just chatting, getting along really well. And he was, he was looking at something, and he was looking at buying one himself, and I was just sharing all these ins and outs of it and what I learned. And so I said, nice meeting you. My name's Graham. What's your name? And 
He said his name and I put up my hand to shake his hand and he moved to shake my hand. And this man was probably about 55, 60 years old. He moved his hand to shake my hand and he stopped, he froze, he looked up at me and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I watched the news too much. He apologized for watching the news. He says, can we elbow bump? And I was like, okay. He's like, I've been, I've been triple, you know, jab, but I, I, I just, I, I watched the, he was apologizing for watching the news. And I was like, oh, whoa. On some level, he's conscious that this has been deeply impacting him. And I think to an extent that, that I am so baffled of how, how much the news, the power it has to shape people and how, how it can control their behaviors. And this gentleman in particular, who, uh, who knew it was going on, but still couldn't break free from it, or still chose to, to not uh, go with what he felt intuitively, like to go and shake my hand. So it's a balance that I think uh, we're in this really, really interesting time in human history where we are understanding the power of narrative and story and the media and how it is shaping our reality. And the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel is that we are also, once we take this power back from, from those big media organizations, those people that have control of the narratives, and we take it back and we allow that more open debate and people to have conversations again, uh, it will be a, a rebirth and a new era of storytelling, of news, of reality, of so many different things because it has been controlled for so long. So we are going through the transformation of this part of our society and it's difficult. Of course it's going to be difficult. It's, it's, it's like um, you're going through a transformation. You know, the caterpillars are turning into a butterfly. It's like, it's, it's not easy. So, um, so I think it's important to answer your question is to have strong uh, values and and boundaries um, be open to have conversations with people if they're respectful if they're sincere and if they actually want to reach a win-win if they don't and they just want to yell and scream their point and cancel you I'm sorry <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to protect myself and I'm going to say hey it's not fair like th this has got to work both ways so if you're not willing to be open and have a conversation then I'm sorry I'm going to go over here and I hope that eventually, that uh, as a society, we can, we can come back together. And I'm seeing that happen. I'm seeing people slowly come back together. But, uh, you know, it has to be a choice. It has to be sincere. And people actually want to see, actually have that, that ingenuine intention to, to repair the, the divide that has been forced upon us by this, this divisive uh, narrative that's been broadcast in the media. So... It's a tricky one. People just don't want to go and get their own information. And that's, I, I feel like in the world now, like a lot of people just want to be fed their information. Mm. So, and, and it's hard because you, you do have a world that's focused on, you know, social media and, you know, um, celebrity culture uh, type of and, and initiative. And, and so people will listen to these because there is quite a few people who will push that narrative as well and say, oh, those people are crazy and cancel them. So um, I guess my, my question is, is how do people, I mean, do people really have to want to go out and get that information or how do they break from getting it from, you know, just you know, get, what's get, being fed what to them? Saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um. This is a bigger this is a bigger pattern or, or theme that I've seen in life is that there is always there is always this the easy way, the short the short way to get the pleasure now. And there's always the long road, the path less less traveled that leads to sustainability and to true fulfillment or sovereignty. And I think the short sightedness of a lot of people to just accept what they are told or to go along with the popular mainstream is the quick path to pleasure, to being in the in crowd, to being accepted, to um, feeling like you are a part of the solution or you are standing up for justice when you have no risk to yourself at all. So there's always, there, there will, there's always this opportunity to avoid doing the hard work and it always comes with a cost. 
It always does. There's, it's just, it's like a mathematical equation of life. If you take a shortcut, there is a cost. And so I feel like each and every person out there has to get to a place where they go, enough is enough. Uh, the costs are too great. Or they see the costs because of a documentary. Documentaries are fantastic for this because they lay out the situation, or good documentaries, they lay out the situation, they show you the cost of war, or they show you the cost of this, this type of social media in your life. And so once you can see that, you can understand, oh, here are the consequences to not questioning the information that's out there or going along with what everybody tells me to do. Um, th that is, and that is a theme throughout all areas of life. There's always a quick fix. There's always a new workout gadget that you buy and within two weeks you can look like this guy on TV. You know, like that's how they sell you stuff, right? Like they sell you the, the pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, workout machines, your new Apple watch, whatever it is, buy this thing, you get immediate pleasure now. There's no... There's no Apple Watch commercial that shows the person getting up super early day after day and they're just working their butt off and they push past those boundaries. It has nothing to do with the Apple Watch. It has nothing to do with the Apple Watch. That's the, that's the job of advertisers is try and tie the product <laughs> to the spiritual truth of life so that you think that by buying the product that you will get that spiritual profit, that truth, um, and it will just magically appear in your life and it doesn't work that way. There are tools that can help you, but uh, there's a great book by Alex Gray, one of my favorite books, it's a screensaver on my computer, uh, called, the, called the, what's it called? The, uh, the Mission of Art, The Mission of Art. Um, and he talks about this, he would, he would create advertisements for companies and this is what he would say, he said this is the job of the advertising is to sell you this idea of the spiritual union that you can never get through the product, car commercials. It's always about avoiding the traffic and getting out to the outside and being out in this beautiful landscape, you know, with this new car. It's like the car has nothing to do with this. <laughs> so uh, it's just, it's just um, we're, as, a, as, a, as a collective, as humanity is, is growing up, we're, we're at that stage where we're the toddler learning to walk and we fall down and we're realizing, hey, you know what? The short path doesn't work. And eventually, we're just going to be able to walk, and we're just going to see through the BS of off, um, you know, putting putting off the personal responsibility of our our fitness, our health, our information, where we get information from. We're going to stop outsourcing that to other people to give us to an exterior authority to tell us what is, um, you know, good for us or or what we need in our lives, and we're going to just start taking ownership for it. So that's the. To me, that's what I see is the, the evolution of, of human beings on earth is that we're just going to get to a point where we're like, oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and we're going to laugh at these car commercials. We're going to laugh at these, these news media. I mean, I'm sure you've seen that clip where, you know, multiple news anchors say the exact same thing about dangerous misinformation and they, they read the same script like verbatim. Yeah. And, and now we see that and we laugh because we're like, oh my God, like they're, they're, um, they're re literally reading a script and they're not, and it sounds like it's authentic and it sounds like it's coming from them, but it's all a script. And so we're starting to see through it and more and more it's happening. And um, I, I think that that is how we sort of break through is we just continue that process of taking our power back and understanding that everybody's on their own journey and it's not gonna happen all at once. And uh, there are consequences to the short, the short, short route, and there are benefits to putting in the time and the investment for the long haul because that is really what is going to be sustainable. Because we are taking our power back, and we are living true to ourselves, and we are putting in the actual work to make it life lasting. That's really great, and I. I don't want to keep you because I know I'm already over time. So I want to say thank you so much for coming on and uh, for the conversation. And if anyone wants to follow you, uh, where can they find you? Do you have any upcoming projects as well? And w what's going on with the scuba suit? <laughs> uh, well, thanks, Laurie. I've, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm on Instagram. You can search me at Graham Wardle on Instagram. Wait, I got I, I got a blue check mark on Instagram, not on Twitter. They took it away on Twitter, but... Um, 
You can find my social media accounts. If you go to my Instagram account, you search, or you go to Instagram, you search for Graham Wardle. I have a little blue check, beside, check mark beside my name. And then in the link in bio, I have uh, a list of all my other social media accounts. So you can go there, uh, find my podcast and my website and all those different things. Uh, and then the scuba suit is for an upcoming uh, project that I'm on that I don't want to give away because <laughs> I don't want to oh, spoil it. <laughs> I don't, I mean, hey, it, if it works out, I can talk more about it. But the thing is, you know, with new upcoming projects, I've learned my lesson. You know, you talk about it before it's ready. And then if it doesn't work, then people are like, hey, what happened to this? And you're like, ah, well, it didn't work. So it's not what I wanted. So I do my best to, to wait until things are at a certain threshold where I know it's going to come out. Because again, it goes back to the power of your word, right? So I, I, I'm very careful with what I put out there because if I say I'm going to do something and I put it out there, I want to do it. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Graham. Thanks, Lori. This is a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. No problem. Thank you guys so much for listening to the episode. I hope that you really enjoyed it. And I hope that you had some moments where you would laugh and moments that you would really absorb what Graham was sharing. He has some great metaphors that always make me laugh. I was really um, nervous to do this episode and after I listened to it, I was I was very critical of myself and, and how I handled the interview. But now that I've had some reflection time and gone back and listened to it quite a few times, I'm, I'm actually really happy with the conversation and I'm really happy with what Graham shared in the questions that I asked because I think it, there was a lot of good information in there that everyone could take and absorb and maybe change their mind and look at things a little bit differently. So I'm incredibly grateful that he came on the show. Uh, everything that Graham and I spoke about, you can um, check out in the show notes. Uh, there's links for, for all of the things. And I did start um, on the, I just put it out last week on my Power Within podcast Instagram. I've created a uh, playlist for the podcast. I think music is so beneficial in healing and you know, we can we can listen to it in every single mood that we have or anything that we're going through in life. So I ask all of my um, podcast guests at the end if they would share some songs uh, to include in the in the in the playlist. So uh, I've gone back and edited in all of the episodes, and Graham's uh, contributions are in in his show notes as well. So I hope that you guys love the playlist, and I hope that you know it can give you some perspective in different parts of your life and you know have some fun dance and enjoy yourself and uh, I'm so grateful to everyone who's been reaching out to me both publicly and privately to share feedback on my podcast um, it really means a lot that people will listen and and give me honest feedback about what they think or or how they've related to things and I'm so grateful for that I did have a couple people ask me, hey, will you uh, reach out to this person and try and interview, you know, whoever? And I wanted to kind of address that a little bit. My, my hope for this podcast and my intention for it has always been to inspire people and to bring on people who changed my life. And I don't want to compromise that for ratings or people tuning in because I'm, you know, reaching out to this person or that person, the people that I have reached out to and the people who have agreed to come on the podcast so far are people who really changed my life. And, and that's, that's what I want to share. Um, and so it's not that I'm not open to having conversations, but I, I want to keep with what my intention was and what my hope was and that's to create love and unity and hope and inspiration for you guys so the guests that I choose to come on come on the podcast I hope that you guys will continue to enjoy them and love what I share so with that being said if you want to leave a review that would be wonderful or a rating I would appreciate that so much but you know if if only one person listens, I'm fine with that. If it just touches just one person. Um, that's always been my goal. That's always been my hope. And I'm happy with that. And 
you know, that's, that's, that's what my goal is for this. So thank you all so much for tuning in again, and I hope that you'll continue to listen. Thank you, and have a great week.